Today, I had an amazing chat with Dr. Lisa Audette. We talk about communication and independence for autistic young adults. This is an amazing episode, guys, because Dr. Audette was my professor at Kent State over 20 years ago. I can't believe I'm saying that. AKA I'm old, um, but it was amazing to speak with her because she's just a wealth of information. We talked about how we need to help autistic individuals and adults develop a sense of, of who they are, uh, help them self-advocate, talk to them and develop a strengths-based model, um, talked about self-monitoring and how we can really help them with transitioning from an educational environment to a post-secondary environment. And we also talk about communication in the workplace. I'm telling you what, if you are a parent and you have an older child, or if you are a provider and you're working with middle school, high school, autistic adults, uh, and older students, this is such a great listen. Dr. Adet is is on faculty in speech pathology and audiology at Kent State University. She has over 35 years of experience as a special educator and speech therapist working with individuals with autism spectrum disorder and other developmental and behavioral disabilities. She facilitates the Autism Initiative for Research Education and Outreach at KSU and is one of the founding developers of the Autism Certificate and Minor at KSU. She's focused on supporting autistic college students at KSU, creating programs that encourage advocacy and a neurodiversity understanding of autism. Dr. Adet has developed and engaged in study abroad opportunities focused on understanding autism from a cultural perspective with colleagues in Brazil. How fascinating. She's the owner of communication and learning consultation services, and she publishes and presents at the local, state, national, and international level. She is an absolute wealth of information. She was one of my favorite professors back in the day, so make sure that you too Tune in. This is such a great one. You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready to use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech, a speech therapist and board certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. Thanks so much for joining us on episode 48. We have an amazing episode for you today. We have with us Dr. Lisa Audette from Kent State University. And thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Audette. It's so, so nice happy. to have you on. Same here. I'm so glad to connect with you and to do this. <laughs> yes. And I actually had Dr. Audette in class. Oh my gosh. Which feels like forever ago, maybe it was. 22 <laughs> years ago or something crazy. So, um, but it feels like yesterday because you're, you speak so much about autism that I feel like I have connected with you, even though I haven't, because you do talks for speechpathology.com. So do I, you do talks for milestones and all the, I think we're kind of in the same circles here in the autism world. Um, so I'm excited to have you on, but for those of you who are not familiar with your work, can you tell us a little bit about you, your journey to being a speech therapist, maybe how you started specializing in autism and, and all that good stuff? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. So I'm originally a, a special educator. And when I was a teacher of boys who had emotional uh, problems in a residential facility, I started wondering about the connection between communication and behavior. So that's been what has driven me over these 35 years is that connection. And uh, it's as a part of that uh, journey, uh, while I was still a teacher, I actually did training with Lovas and you oh. all know who Lovas is. So uh, back in Boston in the eighties uh, was actually trained by Lovas and then moved on and uh, got my master's in uh, speech language pathology because I was just so interested in this connection. Uh, so it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, then got my PhD in special education from Kent State University. Uh, did read my dissertation in the area of autism with children uh, who were nonverbal and, and have been a professor at Kent State uh, ever since and also have done private practice 
work and, as you know, presenting all here and there. Um, and today, too, I'll talk about uh, as part of my uh, PhD, I actually also studied Skinner. So I'll be sharing uh, some of that wisdom as well. So it's been quite a journey. Uh, and right now, my focus is the individuals who are on our campus, mm -hmm. because more and more uh, young adults who are bright are, are pursuing college degrees and providing services and supports for them. So I'm glad to be, you know, doing, continuing to evolve as I age. And I'm also so thrilled when I see students, Kent State students, and all the wonderful work that they're doing. And they're out there, you know, leading the way. And that makes me very, very proud. That's awesome. I love that you're supporting students. And I, you know, I work three days a week in a middle school, high school here in Ohio as a public school therapist. And I feel very passionate about that age group. I just love it. I, I love how functional it is. I love that I'm helping students. You know, I always say that therapy does not happen in the therapy room for me. It's really all about the larger school environment. That's uh, something I include on a lot of IEPs. But I love mm -hmm. with my job too, is I get to go out and see the students at their work sites, which I just think is so functional. So I'm excited excited for our topic today because I know there's a lot of people um, who are just not sure how to support older adults with autism and mm -hmm. older students. So today our topic is communication and independence for young adults with autism. So I'm excited to talk about that and um, something that I think we all really need to talk about how to support um, older students. So can you tell us just mm -hmm. some needs that you would think off the bat because you're so immersed in how you're helping um, older students, autistic students, but what are some needs that maybe speech therapists in the school schools or in clinical practice um, would be able to support our students with? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I find most often is that um, young adults with autism need to develop a better sense of who they are um, and an understanding of what it means to have autism. What does it mean to be autistic? Um, you know, and I, we're, we both know that many young adults are now exploring that. And as a result, they're guiding us mm -hmm. <laughs> and they view their identity as autistic. So someone like me, who's been using person first language right. because I wanted us to recognize that there was a person here. I'm being educated by them as well. Um, so I think they, you know, really need to begin to understand the strengths um, and we need to use more of a strengths-based model when we're working with them. Um, because if they don't understand their strengths as well as the challenges, it really, I think, leads to uh, poor self-esteem, poor self-awareness, lack of acceptance. Um, and we have, are learning more and more about masking yes. and camouflaging, which right. is in that population, mm -hmm. uh, which... It is really difficult to to uh, fathom for me personally when mm -hmm. I um, see somebody kind of denying who they are, and so I think that makes we. I think we need to look at the work that we do, and are we promoting a sense of value that you have strengths that we're going to work with to help you overcome some challenges, and that you have a lot uh, a lot to con to contribute. Um, and I also think that. Uh, talking to them about self-care. Uh, you know, you and I both know, and many of our listeners know that self-regulation can be very difficult mm -hmm. for people with autism, but are we encouraging them to pay attention to their, you know, what their needs are mm -hmm. um, and any signs that they might realize that, oh, this doesn't feel very good uh, to me. I need to step back. I need to ask to leave. You know, um, one example would be, um, you know, a middle schooler who has olfactory hypersensitivities and being in the lunchroom. Mm. Well, you know, you and I, if we had olfactory hypersensitivities, we would avoid public places to eat because we want to take care of ourselves. So I think beginning to think about, you know, how can we teach them to care for themselves? I also think it would make them much more open to the support we want to give them. Mm -hmm. If they knew that, 
you know, we didn't really want to change them. We want to help right. them learn to care for themselves. Um, I think the other piece is opportunities for work in the high school. And you and I were talking about vocational training, and I think that's critical. Um, and that employers, you know, uh, helping them to understand people with autism as we place students out in, right. in uh, job placements is really uh, important to consider too. So those would be the th the three kind of main things that I would, you know, big picture yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. And I love, yeah. And we've talked about masking here on the podcast. Um, and I would really love to, you have to tell me if maybe I'll email you. I would love somebody to come on and talk about either about masking, who's an autistic adult or um, autism in girls. That's another topic that we haven't, we've done an ASHA proof course previously about autism in girls, but that's another topic because I think all of these things, we have to be so cognizant of social skills, social skills training, kind of this idea of, you know, why are we working on these things? Why are these things important? And I think the way that I always try to frame things, and obviously I talk with my students because they're older, but is thinking about them as seeking competitive employment and things like that, right? Where it's probably twofold, where I'm sure you're doing a lot of this too, where you were talking with employers about autism and about our learners needs, and then also working with the autistic individual so that they can also advocate for what they need. Maybe they need to take a break or step away. Or when you said lunchroom, I was like, I was taken back to like 1997 when I graduated high school and how disgusting the lunchroom was. So yeah, you know what I mean? Like I remember having a study hall in the cafeteria after lunch. Um, so yeah, those are all things that are important to, uh, to, to think about. And I love that idea about supporting um, what can we support prior to graduation? Because I know working with middle school and high school students, I'm always kind of thinking about why is what I'm working on important? And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I have worked um, three years at a non-public program. Well, many years, actually, non-public program um, here in this area, but we would have special education directors come in. And here I am 24 working with autistic individuals who have very intense behavioral barriers. And then I am getting kind of bombarded Parted with questions from special education directors about why I'm working on something, why mm -hmm. is it important? Um, and so I think it gave me a really um, good education and why am I working on these things as a speech therapist? Like, why is it important for me to work on matching with a middle school or high school student, right? Because I know that they then at their job site can work on matching and that this is something that generalizes. So I think sometimes it's hard for people to have that vision. I'm really lucky in that fact that I work in a very, like a kind of a smaller district. So I am the middle school therapist. I also work with some high school students. And so I have that vision of, you know, why is this important now? Why is it important to address? But mm -hmm. would you have any tips for people that maybe have, because um, we do have parents that listen too. So if you have a middle school or high school autistic student that either you're serving or that is your own child, you know, what are some things that we can start to think about? Because, you know, in Ohio, we start to do that transition on the IEP at age 14. Mm. And so, and it's great because we need to say, and we always need to be saying, right? Like, why are we doing this? Like, why is is this functional, right? Yes. Uh, you sound like me when I'm teaching and I <laughs> tell my students that they must always be ready to answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they can't answer that question, then they need to go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. So seeing how what we're doing actually connects to something larger uh, or is part of a developmental process um, is so important. And so I guess I would encourage parents to ask their therapist, to ask their teachers, why are you doing this? Um, and to think about the answer that they get. Um, and for all of the professionals to be ready to, to answer that question. You know, it, um, and that's actually my... Um, Student teacher, student teaching uh, supervisor was the one who told me that, who said at any moment in time, anybody can walk in the room and ask you why, and you better be ready to answer. Um, and that has stayed with me for a long time. And I'm glad to hear that 
<laughs> it's perpetuated yes. out there. Um, so I think uh, that is a good place for us as professionals to be thinking about that big picture and how it connects. Um, I also think it's important to think about what are the strengths of the individual with autism as we look at vocations. So while we might be thinking that, you know, this individual is going to work in a, um, a, a in a, a shop or a place where they're going to re- need to match things mm-hmm. um, for for work. That's that might be our vision, but is that our students? And does our student have a vision? So right. maybe that's not something that they're really interested in and they're going through the motions. So I think the why becomes bigger in terms of um, you know our our thoughts about what their where their future goes and mm-hmm. the family and the individuals thought about where their future goes. I recall many years ago being on an IEP team and the individual with autism and the family were looking at him as developing his art skills and selling his art. Mm-hmm. And the IEP team said, well, you know, we want to teach him janitorial janitorial skills so that he can be employed. Yeah. And the family was like, and the individual was like, I'm not interested. So I, and you know, the, the family was told, well, that'll, the art will be a nice hobby. I think, you know, thinking outside the box right. about the why, you know, who's, uh, whose agenda is it mm-hmm. is important. And that kind of brings me and, you know, it's so hard because we're talking about such a broad spectrum. Right. right? So individuals who ha- might have huge behavioral needs, you know, and lots of self-regulatory needs, that is a different picture mm-hmm. many times than individuals who are pursuing their PhD in neurobiology and also right. happen to have autism <laughs> right. um, and are in the 99th percentile on an IQ right. test. Right. Um, but I think overall, you know, the self, what does self-advocacy look like mm-hmm. for the lower functioning individual as well as the higher functioning individual? Mm-hmm. And I, as we as therapists or parents and professionals, how are we supporting self-advocacy? You know, one of the things I expect is that when my clients or the students on campus are attempting to self-advocate, that they're going to mess up. They're going to stumble. Mm-hmm. They're going to sound obnoxious. They might sound bossy. Mm-hmm. That's part of the, that's part of their learning. And if I cut them off and I say, well, well that's not appropriate. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to have this discussion because you're not, you know, when you learn <laughs> right. how, to, how to do this, then we'll talk. It's like, no, my job is to help them learn how to, how to do it and support them in doing it. Um, and I think if we don't, we end up in a power struggle with our young adults because they're teenagers. What do teenagers want? Independence. autonomy, <laughs> independence, mm-hmm. right? They want it. They want to develop. So you have this developing human being with autism who wants those things. You end up with a power struggle. And that's where like I go back to uh, B.F. Skinner's work in the 1940s, where uh, he cautioned that um, punishment, like saying to somebody, we're not going to, that's inappropriate. We're not going to talk about that. Right. Um, he cautioned against punishment in right. uh, his book, um, Education uh, and Human Behavior, and said that if we use punishment, like we're not talking, mm-hmm. it can lead to anxiety. Well, right. who's anxious? Kids with autism. <laughs> Especially Avoiding. during the pandemic. I mean, there's a lot of people, yeah. right? That are, it's like, what What are what are the characteristics of anxiety? Okay. Yeah, I think like a lot of people have that yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, just it's it's really a lot. Yeah, that's a good point because yeah. I think a lot of people do say that. Like I have a student, just hearing you talk, I have a student who um, actually is not even receiving speech therapy services anymore, but I have known for, um, for so long, 10 years probably, and he really has a special interest 
interest, a deep interest. I think that's how we're supposed to say it now, a deep interest in talking about outdoors. And he just loves nature and all these things. And, you know, he had had different um, therapy goals about trying to talk about different things just to give him practice, you know, and I always framed it as competitive employment. And, and then he's, this student's just flourishing and doing amazing. And, you know, his parents know that he has that special interest. And so all of his vocational resources are going to be towards working outdoors and all those things. Um, But it's so funny because I went to see him. I went to see another student at this place where all these students are at. And I walk in and this student has leaves in his hands because the thing is, and this is how I feel too, is that this is who this person is. And who am I to say that we're not going to talk about these things, just thinking about it as social skills and the whole masking, you know, giving them options of like, this is small talk, this is expected in the work environment. So I want you to feel comfortable with it. You know, we do a lot of small talk at work that maybe we don't really care about, you know, but I would never want somebody to feel like they can't talk about something. And I think what I have found Dr. Adet too, is that I have definitely been in tune with what autistic adults are telling us, you know, um, using autism, you know, saying autistic instead of person first. And sometimes that's, you know, dependent on the individual always asking. To me, it's kind of like their pronouns, but, you know, I try to never change who that person is. But I think sometimes what we're dealing with in that sense is how can we work with the team (laughs) to try to share, you know, and advocate. I think sometimes if you are listening to autistic adults and you are taking that information in that not everybody's kind of up to speed with what's going on in the autistic community. So are you finding that you're having to kind of advocate for kind of that movement and some of the things that people are bringing up? Yes. Um, Yes, very much so. And I think um, learning more about disability studies, learning more about ableism, uh, looking at the World Health Organization view Mm -hmm. of disabilities, Mm -hmm. um, and then universal design. You know, those four concepts are coming together and and. Um, are more and more part of the curriculum, a college curriculum for somebody going into education or speech language pathology. And I think those those four concepts really have a lot to teach us. And you're absolutely right. You know, we don't want to deny who the person is, but we want to give them some skills so they can get along. Right, right. <laughs> um, and I, I agree with that, you know, wholeheartedly. I also think that we're learning more and more about executive functions right. in kids and people with autism, people with ADHD, people with depression, just mm-hmm. executive functions. And um, having intervention that helps to develop executive functioning mm-hmm. is much more powerful than and then the, the individual can be in charge of themselves if they are giving executive functioning skills. And um, certainly uh, Michelle Garcia Winner's work that really focuses on executive functioning and Diane Williams work in, uh, um, in Pennsylvania is really helping to educate us. So I think as we put these pieces together, we Mm -hmm. come up with something that is much more affirming and positive and integrated Mm -hmm. for people um, who are on the spectrum. Yeah. So what are, and I actually just had somebody, I don't know if you've heard of Sarah Ward, but she does a lot of talk about executive function. So we actually just had her on. It was very, it was just fascinating. I've already incorporated some of her feedback into some of our middle school IEPs, which I'm, I'm excited. I, oh, went to, I went to work the next day and I was like, you guys will never guess. I had somebody on the podcast and it was so great. Um, so what are some strategies? So I know we talked about self-advocacy, but if we're kind of thinking about what we can really hone in on for these students who are transitioning to post high school education or um, to work settings or, you know, to a university like Kent. I know that Kent has a a program. What are some for sure things that we should be working on? I know we talked about self-advocacy and this idea of executive function. Um, Yeah. And also uh, um, self-care. I think, you know, everybody's executive functioning profile is going to look different. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, when I'm working with middle schoolers and then with the college individuals, I um, encourage them to self-assess. Mm-hmm. 
And we'll use an executive functioning model. So, you know, listing the different executive functions and talking about how those are manifested in work settings, social settings, Mm -hmm. um, academic settings, and creating goals from that. And then asking them on a regular basis to rate how they think they did on that particular goal and providing them with feedback and comparing. So you think you gave yourself a five, like, you know, expert in organization, but you didn't turn these things in. And so I'm giving you a two. So there's a discrepancy here. Mm -hmm. And using that concrete visual as a way of talking about your perception of self as compared to others perception and, you know, talk about theory of mind, there it is. Mm -hmm, (laughs) Um, And the other is uh, talking to them. Sometimes I don't, I find that individuals with autism don't connect the consequence to the action Mm. going back and saying, so you, you know, they realized something happened and there was a consequence to it, but what happened before that event There was an action, you know, there was an impulse, there was a miscommunication, there was um, disorganization, there was something that happened before you forgot to turn your homework in. Right. And they're like, well, I got punished because I didn't turn my homework in. But what what action happened before that? Oh, I spent two hours on a video game. Okay, (laughs) that's the action. Um, Versus, and that's what we have to, that piece is what we have to hone in on versus you got to get your homework in. You got to get your homework in. No, let's intervene and say, what happens before that particular behavior that leads to the consequence? Yeah, I love that idea. And when I had Sarah Ward on, she talked about how there was research when you ask a kid, who's a typical language learner to tell you, like, tell me about your homework assignment. Like, tell me about after school, how you're going to get it done. That a person who has kind of robust executive function skills would say, okay, I'm going to come home. I'm going to put my book bag down. I'm going to get a snack. I'm going to watch TV for 30 minutes or do my iPad. Then I'm going to sit down at the table in the kitchen. I'm going to write out the summary. You know, they go by it. They use hand motions. They use more (laughs) robust language versus somebody who really is struggling with executive to function and they would be like, I'm going to do my work. You know, it was like very interesting. And so her idea, and it kind of correlates with what you're saying is that we really have to have a plan on how we're going to, right? So I think for some of my kids and based on a student's language level, you know, showing them like, this is how you get to the end game. This is the goal, right? The assignment. So how do we kind of like a task analysis, right? Mm -hmm. From applied behavior analysis. So how are we going to get there? But I love that idea. And I love that you're talking about self-monitoring because I definitely work on that with my students. I have a couple students who during every session, they self-monitor, like they know what their goal is. We go over it we work on the goal and then they check in about how they think they did. That is great. Yeah, that is great. And with the uh, younger kids or lower functioning kids, um, I do something called stop, think and make a plan. And it's a stoplight um, on a board. And at the bottom are icons about what's the plan. So uh, years ago, uh, I had a young kid who had a real hard time kind of modulating his temperature and he would get thirsty. And when he would overheat and get thirsty, he was like a bull in a china shop. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, you need to stop. You're going to go outside and for recess, let's stop think the yellow light was think make a plan and then underneath were velcroed icons of what's your plan to bring my water bottle right i have to bring my water bottle and you could do it with just about anything with this stop think and make a plan and it's i it's funny because i met him like 15 years later and he was telling me that he was watching some movie and there was this really funny line in the movie and the line was what's your plan what's your plan <laughs> so it had really stuck yes, with him um, but good. you're absolutely right that stop think and make a plan and then rewarding him and giving him praise for you tried really hard to stick with your plan. Right. You you, you Mm -hmm. really did make a plan and 
work on it. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, an important skill. And then the self-assessment, you know, how yeah. did you do with that? Yeah, I like that. I like that dialogue about that because really I always say, you know, my goal is to maybe work myself out of the job of speech therapists, right? So we have to imp- we have to embed these self-monitoring and self-assessment. I like that's that's really good. Um, so what are some other, have we not hit on some strategies that you might want to share about um, you know, how we can help autistic adults increase their communication competence? Anything you yeah. Want to in that area? Uh, yeah, I think uh, as I think about that question, um, I think teaching them about miscommunication, mm-hmm. that miscommunication mm-hmm. is a part of life right. um, and that we repair mm-hmm. we, in communication, we repair and we request clarification and we provide clarification, some of those higher pragmatic functions. Um, so like on a concrete level, uh, a client, a student goes, loves to go and play in the computer lab and was told, the teacher said, you can come in here anytime you want, except when I'm not here. Well, he went in when the teacher wasn't there. So he was then banned from the computer lab for X amount of days. Well, what do you do with that? Well, talking to that child about, well, we got to repair that. There's a relationship here. You Mm -hmm. really like this guy. You want to go in there. What can you do to repair that? Mm -hmm. So, oh, I can write him a letter. I can ask to go and meet with him. And those are, those are important soft skills (laughs) to be able to follow up um, after to um, repair that, that relationship and to say, oh, well, I thought you meant when you said it was bored, I thought you meant a piece of wood. Right. I didn't know you meant that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and those things are happening all the time mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, and I think we can do it with little ones too, or lower right. functional ones that they rep- when some, something happens, they repair it. They go to right. the person and if they're nonverbal, they have a device or whatever, they say, I'm sorry, or they, we start, those are all require executive functions mm-hmm. as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Perception and stuff. So persist for our, our ability to continue to persist at those higher level pragmatic functions beyond requesting and protesting mm-hmm. and greeting. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I, I was, I had Dr. Kerry Magger on who I was talking to before we hit record and he is an autistic adult and he receives speech therapy and all these different types of services. And, um, and now he's done Ted talks, but we were just talking about how very nuanced social skills are just for me being a typical language learner, um, that it's just depending on what group of friends you're in, what setting you're in, how well, you know, people put in a pandemic and it's like, (laughs) I mean, it's just very, very nuanced. So I always try to tell the kids that are a little bit older that maybe I'm just kind of helping to support social skills that I just say that I'm here to be your social coach. You know what I mean? Because (laughs) I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people need a social coach, just there's different things that maybe you've never been in this experience or you've never been to that workout class or it's a new experience, you know, and I think that a lot of people just don't know. And I like the idea about miscommunication because I think just from kind of what I've seen on social media, you know, sometimes people can perseverate on that miscommunication that happened. It can cause them anxiety, or maybe they don't realize that it even happened, you know, and it can, yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes we're afraid, and I've seen this happen like in the workplace with higher functioning individuals who aren't performing at the level that the employer expects, yeah. but the employer is afraid right. to express it because they don't want to hurt the person's feelings. Mm-hmm. But then we lose a great opportunity right. <laughs> to work through the development of skills. And the person goes off and says, well, they just didn't need me anymore. I was laid off when really yeah. they were fired because right. they, but they, um, so we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. The work, the work <laughs> continues on. Um, yeah. are, are, are there any supports that exist that you would want to talk about that can be set up to help autistic adults or anything that you might want to share that we haven't addressed? Because we haven't really talked about that too much on the podcast yet. Yeah, um, well, I'm going to focus on the college yeah, individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the state of Ohio, um, through the request of the governor, has placed a vocational counselor from OOD, Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, mm -hmm. on every campus, every state campus oh. around. Yes. Okay, great. And that person's job is to interface with the Student Accessibility Services and Career Center. Um, to assist individuals who voluntarily approach them mm -hmm. um, for support, um, to assist them in making sure they succeed in school, and then uh, find making helping them obtain and maintain a job. And we have a at Kent State, we have a wonderful OOD counselor and she's kind of like the best kept secret because yeah. people don't know to go and do that. But if folks are thinking of, you know, if you're in, have a high yeah, school, right, that's good to know. Looking at a state school, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to find out who that OOD vocational counselor is, get them on board. They can provide the student with whatever concrete materials they need. Yeah. So if it's a smart pen, if it's an iPad, if it's a read and write gold, whatever that assistive technology would be to assist them, you know, that that is determined that would mm -hmm. be helpful to them, they can obtain. So that that's a wonderful resource throughout Ohio um, that I think people don't really know about, parents yeah. don't know about, mm -hmm. high school educators don't know about, um, and could really make a public education um, more doable because that's something wow. that is that is available to them. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, you know, we have so many, we're so fortunate in Ohio, we have O'Cali and we have Milestones. Mm -hmm. um, um, the Organization for Autism Research is another resource mm -hmm. that I use they have a, a wonderful book for college bound mm. individuals. Um, and then of course the, whatever county board of DD that is available. Well, that's great. Yeah. I didn't know about that with the, on each campus. So that's actually good for, for me to know, because I definitely have worked with that organization that once you start working with high school students, there's a lot of people in the meetings that are from adult services, but I don't think that I knew that about each campus. So I definitely will share that, um, with my district. And, uh, I love that so much. And, uh, OAR. Yeah, I was, I, uh, I was meaning to, I want to try to get Peter Gerhart on the, um, I'm sure, you know, Peter Gerhart. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, he is really awesome too. I just, every time I hear him talk, I'm just, he lights me up. I love it. He has oh, really great information to share too. So, well, this was so fun to chit chat and I love it. So where can people find out more about you and your work, Dr. Audette? Yeah. So I'm at Kent State in speech pathology and audiology. They can email me at laudette at kent.edu. Um, that's probably the best email to reach me. My, uh, uh, business email is quite long, so I'm not going <laughs> to share it. Um, but they and they can also go to the Kent State website and look at speech pathology and audiology and um, get information about me there. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it, was it was great, great to, to have you. Time with you. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.